Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Ted Kenny. Uh, I am uh, an assistant attorney general uh, with the uh, division that represents the Agency of Human Services. Uh, so that is uh, basically a lot of the services that the state government provides, um, Department of Mental Health, Department of Health, uh, Departments of uh, uh, Health uh, Access, uh, Aging Independent Living, um, DCF, uh, Economic Services. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, that's, that's my job. Um, before that, I was in private practice. I uh, started my practice in Richmond, Vermont uh, in 1991. You may be able to see uh, when I'm on the screen that it says Kenny Law Offices behind me. That's because I'm in my, um, my home office in Williston and that's the sign that I had uh, in front of my office in Richmond. So um, anyway, so the, the topic tonight is understanding state government and I will uh, uh, forego any jokes. I couldn't think of any. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, going on how maybe nobody really knows. No, no, nobody does understand state government, <clears throat> but we're going to do our best. So um, that's the topic. And what are our goals tonight? Our goals are to gain an understanding of how Vermont state government is organized, and learn how to access state government. Um, if we can do that, I think that we've got a pretty good understanding of what the state government is and what it does. So I'm going to start out with a cautionary tale, and these are actually more in the form of cautionary tale questions. Um, the first one is, a, a resident asks a town select board member or city council member, uh, and, and the person is contacted about increasing the minimum wage or mm. dealing with gun control or universal health care. The second is a voter asks a state legislator or the governor, and I, I messed up my grammar on this question, so I apologize, um, to stop the placement of a new building um, or uh, in your town or city. So the question is, should you ask these people these questions? And the answer is no. The reason for that is the way that the Vermont government is divided. Vermont towns and cities have no authority to pass laws. And by the way, when a town or a city passes a law, it's called an ordinance as opposed to a statute, which is what the legislature passes. Um, but they have no authority to pass laws or ordinances that govern things like minimum wage or gun safety or health care coverage. And likewise, the legislature and the governor have no authority over zoning and development issues. So let's get into a little bit about why that is. Vermont is a Dillon's rule state. What? That comes from a, a decision from the early 1800s, actually not in Vermont. I think Dillon was a Supreme Court justice in Nebraska. Um, but in any, any event, this has become kind of a term of art. If you say Dillon's rule, everybody who does this kind of law knows uh, what that is. I'm a member of the select board of the town of Williston and um, uh, about a year ago, uh, we had people telling us, uh, you can't do that because this is a Dillon's rural state. And they were right. Um, Vermont cities and towns receive all of their legal authority from the Vermont legislature. Mm. They, are, they are entirely creatures of the legislature. They are uh, what's known as municipal corporations. And they're not corporations like General Motors or something, but they are in the sense that they are their own government, their own legal entity. They can sue and be sued. They can own land. They, they can do a, a lot of things like that. But they can only do those things because they have the legal authority that was granted to them from the Vermont legislature. Um, and cities and towns can only exercise power if that power is granted in express words by the legislature, necessarily or fairly implied in or incident to the powers expressly granted, meaning it's obvious that it didn't say that they can do this, but it, the law wouldn't make sense if they couldn't, so obviously they can. And third, those essential to the declared objects and purposes of the town or city. So basically the, the deal is though, if it's, if it's not in the, the, the law that creates the, the um, the law that creates the town or city, then just assume it's the town or city doesn't have that authority. So what are the general powers of cities and towns in the state of Vermont? What they can do, 
they can en enact zoning laws, um, what kind of activities, what kind of buildings can go on what land, whether you can put a gas station in a residential uh, neighborhood or whether you can put a uh, uh, farm in the middle of uh, downtown Burlington. Um, that the, the town or city has the ability to create laws that govern that. They can impose a property tax, which for a very long time was the only way that municipalities could gain uh, revenue. They can also nowadays impose a local sales tax if the state legislature approves. Huh. And they can provide services like police, fire, ambulance, recreational, and of course they take care of town roads, city roads and bridges. Um, the, the fact that they have to have the legislature um, uh, grant that authority uh, can be a real sticking point and I'll talk about that in a second. What, what they cannot do, um, towns or cities cannot enact their own or change the state's criminal laws. So if, uh, by way of example, if uh, the, city, the city of Burlington wanted to um, uh, create a law that said that it is a crime to uh, possess a handgun or to do this or that, or that it's no longer a crime to have small quantities of cocaine, uh, would they be able to do that? The answer is no. Um, criminal laws are the exclusive jurisdiction of the state government, not a town or city. They, uh, they also cannot impose an income tax. And again, they can impose a local sales tax, but they can't do it without state permission. Um, when I was in college, I went to St. Michael's and I was a journalism major. And one of the things that I commonly did was uh, for the uh, radio news program that we had that was part of the school, uh, I would cover press conferences. So I would go to Montpelier and I would cover Governor Madeline Cunin's press conferences. And I'd go to Burlington and I would cover Mayor uh, uh, Bernie Sanders' press conference. And I, one of my most vivid recollections was when uh, Bernie was very upset that the legislature was not allowing Burlington to impose a sales tax because back then no city or town was allowed to do that. That's not the case now. Now the legislature will grant that power. But back then it never did. And I have a very distinct recollection of being in the mayor's office with all the other media and Bernie getting more and more angry and saying things like, to our friends in the legislature, where were you when? And that's he kept it, to our friends in the legislature. And it, 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 I, eventually the, that did happen, but I don't think Bernie helped himself by being uh, as, as uh, the way that he was. Mm -hmm. But that, that's been an issue in the, in the state for a long time. Now, towns and cities are allowed to pass a 1% sales tax on um, goods and uh, rooms and meals. Um, and that's gonna be a substantial amount of, of money, uh, but they have to share that with the state too. So um, anyway, but at least, at least it is a revenue source. So all of that uh, begs the question of what do, you, what do you do if you have an issue like the ones that I was just talking about where they can uh, do something. So the question, the, the, the answer is you contact your town or city government with issues concerning things like fire or ambulance or police services. And, and that would be in general um, that you think they should have another ambulance or there should be a fire station or an outpost in your neighborhood or there shouldn't be. Um, that would be something you would call the town or city, either the executive, which in Burlington would be a mayor uh, or uh, in most towns and cities, there's a city or a town manager or your select board member or your city council. Now that said, obviously for uh, emergencies on these things, you don't call any of those people, you call 911. Um, you would also contact town or city government officials for things about the property tax, or property uses, yours and others. So uh, by way of example, if you wanted to put an addition on a house or you were upset that your neighbor was building an addition on theirs and it looked like they didn't have the right, that, that it just seemed wrong, they didn't have the right permits for it or something. That would be something you would call the town or city government over. You would never call the state on that because they wouldn't care because they don't have any power over these things. Mm -hmm. um, parks and recreational services, same thing. You would want to contact the town or city on those kinds of things. Um, if you think the, uh, uh, baseball field, you know, 
garbage cans need to be emptied more or there are dogs running around on the soccer field or there should be more swing sets in a in a park those are things that are going to be handled by the town government or city government not the state government um, property taxes property tax payments property tax rates things like that uh, an appeal uh, if the if you own a house and they they appraise it and say it's worth this much so this is what your property tax is going to be and you think that they they appraised it wrong um, those would be things that you would contact your town or city government uh, over um, other things things like noise complaints um, those are almost always in the purview of the town or city uh, if it's really bad you know like a criminal type noise then you know you might want to call the police on that um, but just in general uh, that would be something you would contact the uh, the town or city government for um, also, something that, that comes up uh, a lot, um, but I think people don't understand is, is dog and animal complaints. Um, a city council or a select board in Vermont actually has the authority, the legislature gave it the authority, um, to decide uh, complaints on dogs and animals. And, and most, most ordinances that towns have talk about dog bites or animal attacks. Um, and that, that can, I've, as a select board member in Williston and as a lawyer before I was in the attorney general's office in private practice, uh, I've actually had to deal with this issue where uh, people came to my select board because uh, a dog attacked uh, a neighbor. Um, and the neighbors were saying either muzzle this dog, put it down or make it leave the town. Um, yes. Likewise, I've represented people in front of uh, town governments when they've been attacked by dogs uh and, and it's almost by the way it's almost always people who it's the second or third time the dog has attacked somebody and they're just very irresponsible um well the select board or the city council has the authority to do uh, a lot including actually euthanize the animal mm -hmm. um uh and i've never seen that but i have seen um uh the law actually allows uh the the town government to uh, ban the the animal from town uh like something you know get out of dodge city out you know in the old west or something like that which is i think kind of a throwback um one one thing on this issue if anybody's uh interested in in uh an issue that probably isn't a burning issue but could be sorry um it, my phone was on um was the um a lot of town and city ordinances on this issue are written so that the animal attack has to happen on or off of the dog's property. Um, and these days uh, that we changed that in Williston and I would recommend if anybody uh, has the interest to bring this to other people's attention that they change it in, in their town or city as well. Because uh, uh, these days, a lot of times, you know, not many people have picket fences or stockade fencing around their property. And, uh, you know, it's pretty easy to walk across somebody else's lawn. Um, you know, it's that the town government should have authority over things like that. Uh, and most of them don't, but they could if they just change their ordinance. But uh, it's something that is kind of slipped through the cracks. I, I experienced this when a, um, uh, an ordinance in Hinesburg actually was written in a way where the Hinesburg Select Board couldn't do anything about a really terrible dog attack, uh, a dog that was owned by extremely irresponsible people. Anyway, just that. Something else people should know, um, public schools are run by school districts and school districts are actually their own governments. Um, they are separate from the town or city that they are in. So um, by way of example, the, uh, in my town, the town of Williston, uh, before mergers used to happen, I was actually on the Williston, select, uh, the Williston uh, School Board. Um, the Williston School District was its own government. Um, it is not under the control of the town. Uh, it, it has its own budget. It has its own taxing authority. And that's true with now the unified school districts that we have, uh, including the one that would cover Burlington. Um, so the city council and the, and the mayor's office, um, they, they may have influence and they might be able to do some things around the edges, but in terms of school policy, uh, that, is, that is the school board that uh, is its own government. And again, that's a government that was created by the legislature. So 
you'd contact the school or school board for things like obviously issues with your child or a student. Um, educational property taxes, which is actually the bulk of property tax payments in the state of Vermont. Um, most prop the property taxes that you pay, the vast majority of that amount actually is going toward the schools, um, not, not municipal government. Um, municipal government is actually not nearly as expensive because their expenses aren't nearly as big as the schools. They don't have, the town government doesn't have to pay teachers. It doesn't have to heat three buildings. It does have to heat some buildings. Um, doesn't have to run school buses. Uh, doesn't have to do special ed uh, programming that is never paid for adequately by the feds. Um, doesn't have to do any of that stuff and the schools do. So your property taxes mainly go, not, not in like 90%, but they, most of it goes to the, to the school government. Um, also, if you wanted to uh, complain or, or take issue with a school sport, or, you know, if you wanted the school to have this sport or not have this sport, or there's a mascot, there's been a movement in Vermont to um, get rid of mascots that are racially insensitive. Uh, those, those are things that a school board deals with, not a city council or a select board. Um, likewise, extracurricular activities, uh, things like that. Um, in the schools, equity inclu and inclusion issues, that would be something that the school board would deal with, not a city government. Uh, and of course, curriculum and academic courses would be something that would be handled by the school government, not the town or city government. Before I move on, I do wanna say something about the county, county governments in Vermont. Um, county governments in Vermont have almost no power at all. Um, very different than most of the rest of the country. Um, in most of the rest of the country, the county government has a significant role to play in uh, what we have as municipal services, roads, law enforcement, um, things like that. Um, but in, Chittin, in, in Vermont and like by Chittenden County, any county, there are really uh, very few elected officials in county government. One is the prosecutor, the state's attorney, is a county employee. Uh, the other is the sheriff, and the third is the assistant judges. But even even those budgets, the state's attorneys and sheriffs are actually run out of a state uh, agency, the department Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, or sheriffs and state's attorneys. Um, so the the county government would be uh, almost nothing uh, that and, does stuff. And and by the way, interestingly enough, the Biden administration's payments to municipal governments under the American Rescue Plan. Um, there's a there's a snag right now because the federal government doesn't understand that Vermont's counties actually don't do anything, and they the, the law is designed to funnel money into municipal governments starting with counties, um, and so our congressional delegation and other people are trying to fix that to make sure it, and they will, uh, but it's it's something that they have to make sure that doesn't get held up because otherwise, you know, the feds would try to pay money stimulus money to a county government the county government would say that's great but we don't have anything to spend it on we don't own any roads um we don't run the police departments we don't run the fire departments we don't have rec we don't have social programs anyway county governments have a very limited role in vermont uh state uh governance so that that brings us to vermont state government Those are kind of basic, but let's start with the basics. Um, there are three branches of government uh, in Vermont uh, and pretty much every other state. Uh, there's the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judicial branch. The legislative branch in Vermont, as Sandy knows, having been a member of it, is called the General Assembly. Um, the General Assembly is composed of two houses, the House of Representatives and the State Senate. Still a member of it. Um, they uh, both have to pass laws that would then go to the executive branch. The executive branch is basically run by the governor um, and it has many state agencies, and I'll get into those in a slide uh, coming up. Uh, but it's uh, the agency that actually executes the law that the legislature puts in and, and runs the budget that the legislature approves. The third branch, the judicial branch, is the branch that interprets the laws. And when we say interpret, it means uh, it can not only interpret it, but can actually overrule laws if they are unconstitutional, because that would mean that the judiciary is interpreting the constitution, either the state constitution or the federal constitution. In Vermont, 
there are two levels of, of court. There's the Vermont Supreme Court, and under that is the Vermont Superior Court. The courts changed about 10 or 15 years ago, maybe a little bit less than that, uh, where there used to be um, a superior court and district court and on and on. And they just made that into one thing as the Vermont Superior Court with different divisions that basically do what the old system did. There's the civil division, the probate division, the criminal division and the family division. And I will get into where, where you bring your case and where you should go if you have a problem that you need to go to court over. The legislature in Vermont, the members of the legislature, both state senators and house members are elected to just two year terms. Also the legislature in Vermont is uh, part-time. It meets for about half the year, um, which I think is a good thing. Uh, because uh, it keeps people close to the voters and make sure that we don't have legislators who are more interested in keeping their jobs uh, than uh, doing the right thing. Um, the state Senate is comprised of 30 state senators. Uh, each represents about 20,300 people in the state of Vermont. They're broken down mainly by county, but not completely. Um, the, the Senate districts are named after the counties where most of their district is, but they're actually generally different districts than that. Um, in the House, there are 150 members uh, of the House. And uh, so each of those House members represents about 4,100 people. Uh, by way of example, the town of Williston has about 10,000 people and we have two uh, members in the House. Members of the House and members of the Senate are elected at, uh, um, at large in their district. And that means that um, everybody in Williston votes for two members of the House. And um, the top two vote getters win. It's not like the people on the west side of town have one person and the person on the east side of town have another person. If you're in a House district or a Senate district, then that is the, um, uh, uh, then, then you vote for everybody that way. OK. <laughs> So what does the legislature do? What power does it have? The legislature is empowered to make law and that's subject to the governor's power to veto a bill and it would be subject to the Supreme Court deciding that what they did was unconstitutional. But it is a massive power. And what I mean by law is the legislature can pass all laws. Um, they can decide what is or is not a crime. Um, they can decide the income tax and sales tax rates in the state. The legislature decides the social service spending and the budgets. It decides the policies governing how those services are provided. Um, it, it, only the legislature can amend the state constitution, which is the ultimate law in the state, although federal law always trumps state law. Uh, that was determined 100% with the conclusion of the American Civil War, mm. where the feds, the, the union won, and states have their rights not uh they don't ever trump the federal uh, uh law by the way that that even applies to federal regulations um so if a regulation is uh, created by the federal government and it's in contradiction to a state statute that the legislature passed the federal regulation wins the feds always win um the legislature always has uh, also has the power to decide what a town or city can do use for its powers um, as I was talking about with the sales tax, that was something new. Um, there are other things that uh, the legislature will, there's a process that the towns and cities go through to, to amend what they can and cannot do or ask the legislature. Um, it's called a charter change. Each town or each city's laws that the legislature, the legislature creates these uh, is called a charter. And um, they specifically say, you know, the city of Burlington is allowed to do this. The, they're more fancy and legal than that, but that's the idea. The town of Milton can now impose a sales tax or whatever. Um, the governor can stop the legislature's laws from coming into effect if he vetoes, he or she vetoes the, uh, the law. Um, that would send it back to the uh, legislature, but the legislature can have the final say. Um, the governor's veto can be overridden by a two-thirds majority in favor of overriding it, but that has to be two-thirds in each house, both the Senate and the House, 
uh, not cumulatively, but you count the votes in each uh, chamber. And if two thirds override it, then that's the way it is. I think the most famous example of that in Vermont was when Gover Governor Jim Douglas uh, vetoed um, the gay marriage uh, law. And it went back to the legislature and the legislature overrode his veto and it became law anyway, even though the governor didn't sign it. The um, executive branch is a big, uh, a big endeavor. Um, it is run by the governor. Uh, but the governor is not the executive branch. The governor is just in charge of the executive branch. The executive branch is broken down into a whole bunch of agencies. And I put them in this chart because I wanted people to see that um, it, it is pretty inclusive and uh, you know, covers basically a wide swath of, swath of, of things. Um, so agencies like commerce and community development are trying to, um, as it says, uh, basically bring uh, business, hopefully socially conscious businesses uh, to the state and foster community development uh, at the same time. Agency of transportation, uh, the biggest thing people usually think of is the interstates. Uh, those are uh, kept up and, and maintained by the agency of transportation. But the agency of transportation also has the Department of Motor Vehicles in it. So if you, if you had a problem with your license, it's the DMV. Uh, but that's under the agency of transportation. And actually I have agency of transportation in there twice. Sorry about that, there's only one. Um, agency of natural resources is in charge of protecting the natural resources of the state. Um, they often will bring uh, cases against people who are violating a state law or their own growth permit um, by you know, discharging you know, water where they shouldn't or building where they shouldn't or building on a wetland when they shouldn't do that. A lot of that is going to be handled by the Agency of Natural Resources. Um, Agency of Agriculture, Food, and Markets is really just mainly in charge of uh, agricultural uh, endeavors in the state to try to help farms. And farms these days, as I'm sure you all know, aren't just dairy farms. There's all different kinds of uh, agriculture out there. Maple syrup actually would be part of part of that. Um, the Agency of Education is uh, in charge of obviously educational quality in the state, um, although uh, a lot of that is handled at the local level by the school board. Agency of Digital Services is actually just the computer, the people who uh, run the computer system for the state. Um, that is its own agency now. And the last one is the Agency of Human Services, and that, that, is, that is huge. Um, that includes the Department of Mental Health, the Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living. They're in charge of making sure that people are safe in nursing homes. Uh, they're also in charge of providing a public guardian for uh, adults who don't have anybody else to run, a, a disabled adult who would not be able to run their, their affairs. Um, <laughs> they, they have a, a lot to do. Department of Corrections um, uh, is actually part of the Agency of Human Services. That was, uh, the idea was that uh, uh, that would make it a better chance for uh, it to be rehabilitative. Um, uh, I'll, I'll leave it to people in their own opinion whether that worked or not. Um, Department of Health. The Department of Health has been a, a uh, very busy in the last year with uh, the uh, pandemic. Um, Depart Department of Vermont Health Access basically runs things like uh, the state equivalent of Obamacare um, and uh, things like that. So it, it, if you are um, looking to access health, uh, health care in Vermont, it would be the Department of Health Access. And the last one is the Department for Children and Families. Um, I actually did a seminar for Sandy in this program uh, about a year ago, I think, um, outlining uh, what powers the Department for Children and Families have. But their, their charter is to make sure that people who are, uh, the children who are in need of care or supervision because they've been either neglected or abused um, are not neglected or abused. Their, their goal is to keep children in the family. Um, uh, a lot of times they're successful with that. Uh, sometimes they're not. And obviously there's always going to be a debate whether they didn't do enough or went too far. It's a, it's a very, it's a very difficult uh, job. Mm -hmm. The executive branch. The executive branch, the governor is also elected to a two-year term. That's actually an um, uh, uh, anomaly in the United States. Most governors are elected to a four-year term. 
Um, the governor has the power to veto legislation that I went into before. If he or she doesn't like the law, they can veto it, and then it'll then it does not become law unless the legislature overrides by two thirds vote in each house. The executive branch also, the governor appoints the agencies, agency secretaries and departmental directors. These are the people who actually manage the government. So that's that's a pretty important thing. Um, and it, the governor administers the laws and the budget that the legislature passes. Uh, another thing that I actually didn't put on here is that the, um, the governor actually also um, appoints judges that have to be confirmed by the state Senate, but uh, he does have the authority, he or she has the authority to appoint judges. The governor has to pick though from a list that a, a panel creates. And so that um, uh, that is kind of a limited power. And people may remember that um, when Governor Dean was governor, uh, the that panel forwarded two names to the governor to fill a Supreme Court justice position. And uh, they were actually associate justices on the Supreme Court already, and this would, one of them would have become chief justice had the governor had Governor Dean done that. But Governor Dean didn't want either of those people to become the chief justice, so he said no, and he sent it back and said, "Come up with a different list of names." And I don't know what happened if there was uh, conversations on the side or something, but that's how um, Attorney General Jeffrey Amistoy went on to become the chief justice of the Vermont Supreme Court. Um, and that's how uh, uh, Governor Dean's administration secretary, Bill Sorrell, was appointed to be the attorney general. Um, I think I think Governor Dean wanted Bill Sorrell to be uh, a Supreme Court justice, and um, uh, that didn't work. So he had him become attorney general, and then uh, Bill Sorrell was the attorney general for a, a very long time. I think he has the record or something. So who do you contact in state government? And, and the answer is, it's, it's a big thing. So my answer is go to the state government website. Um, I, I did put down the one major thing in case people need uh, assistance and that's um, benefit programs are actually run by DCF. It's a different section of DCF than the people who are in charge of family services. Um, so if you went to dcf.vermont.gov backslash benefits and you could just Google benefit programs for Vermont government and you get there anyway. But they, they cover things like food assistance, um, which is now called Three Squares Vermont. Um, in the 70s and early 80s, it was called food stamps. Um, they help with crisis fuel if people run out of fuel and they don't have the money to pay for more fuel oil or whatever they're using. Um, they, can get, uh, they can get a payment uh, if they qualify uh, for, uh, from the state government for that as an emergency. Um, the state actually has an emergency assistance program if people um, need money because they are about to have their lights turned off or something like that as well. Um, so uh, again, dcf.vermont.gov backslash benefits uh, for that. Um, housing assistance uh, is this section of DCF that actually was um, uh, financing the homeless people that were uh, uh, sheltered in motels and hotels in Vermont while the pandemic was raging. Um, uh, and that, that was actually part of the housing assistance program. Um, Reach Up, uh, which used to be called Welfare, um, that, that program is covered in this as well. And weatherization, if, if you have an old house that is uh, you know leaking a lot of air and you're losing a lot of heat, um, this pro this they have actually programs that will help you pay to weatherize your house so that you can save uh, energy and save money and stay warmer. So um, dcf.vermont.gov backslash benefits. So these last slides uh, I have are about the judicial system and the, the question is which court do you go to? Um, another. And I've, I've actually seen this as a lawyer. I've seen people do do this wrong. Um, I've seen people show up in uh, Costello Courthouse in Burlington when they should have gone to the Superior Court on Main Street across from Nectar's um, and, you know, file things in the wrong court. So let's go through it. The Family Division, um, none of this is going to come as a surprise, but the Family Division is where one would go to deal with a divorce uh, or parentage. Parentage is if you're not married but you have a child with somebody, 
um, the family division has the jurisdiction and the authority to decide um, who's going to have legal and physical custody of that child, what visitation is going to look like. Um, family division also will deal with child support, whether it was a divorce or whether it was parentage. Family division will also deal with abuse prevention, but I want to be clear about that. It is abuse prevention for things that happen either within a family, spouses, uh, or people who are um, had a dating relationship, uh, brothers and sisters, um, a sexual relationship, or lived lived in the same uh, residence. Uh, uh, then, then the family division has power over abuse prevention cases. It does not have power over jurisdiction for abuse prevention cases for uh, bad things that are happening that are not related to a family. So by way of example, if you are working somewhere and some customer with a mental health issue that you're not married to or related to starts stalking you or threatening you, um, you would not go to the family division to get an abuse prevention order. You would go to civil division. I'll cover that in a minute. But that, that's an important distinction because people can get that wrong. Um, and, and there are forms online uh, to fill out, or if you can't do that, then there are forms at the courthouse that you can just go to. Um, the family division also deals with some mental health cases, um, involuntary commitment, involuntary medication, um, things like that. Um, those are usually brought by the state government, uh, but you can bring those as a private citizen as well. Um, obviously with the right kind of evidence and the right kind of expert witnesses and things like that. Probate division. Probate division deals with uh, wills, trusts, and estates. So, uh, you know, when you pass on, if you have a will, it would go to the probate division, and uh, the probate division makes sure, uh, through making through reports that it receives from the people running the estate, that what happened in the will, uh, what what was written in the will, is what happened in the estate. Wills are kind of like computer programs. Um, they you you have to obey them, and you know whatever the instruction is, that's what you have to do. Um, they'll also deal with guardianships for disabled adults and guardianships for for children. I should have put that in, um, uh, because you can get a guardianship in uh, for a child, and uh, and there are actually contested guardianships over children, and I've been in contested guardianships for disabled adults where more than one person comes forward to try to become the guardian for somebody who is developmentally disabled. Um, uh, but that's uh, that's where you would go is probate division for that. Um, probate division also deals with name changes. If uh, you wanted to change your name, either first or last name, uh, it's the probate court that has the legal authority to say, okay, this is now your legal name, and whatever it is. Um, it does have some child-related uh, uh, cases. Actually, I did cover guardianships up there a second ago, but um, there is such a thing as a private termination of parental rights. Um, it's rare as hen's teeth, uh, but the probate division does have uh, that authority. And um, I've, I've seen those cases. They're just not very often. Usually a termination of parental rights case would be because there's an abuse or neglect case uh, in, in uh, the regular family division. Finishing it up, the civil division uh, in Burlington, that would be, as I said, the superior court across from Nectar's. Um, that, uh, that deals with personal injury cases. If you've been injured in a car accident and uh, you can't get the case settled, that would be where you would bring your case or you, probably your lawyer would bring your cases in civil division. Um, and then just general things, breach of contract. Uh, somebody agrees to paint your house for $3,000 or $5,000 or whatever it is, um, and they don't, um, you would sue them in civil division. Um, as I indicated before, non-family abuse prevention cases, so uh, stalking, um, uh, threats of, of sexual violence uh, from people who are not in a relationship uh, would be handled in civil division as well. Um, boundary disputes, um, if somebody thinks they own this parcel of land, but somebody else says, no, the boundary is six feet over and whatever, uh, I've had those cases. Uh, I came up with this phrase, I think, uh, that uh, boundary disputes are the child custody of real estate law. Um, they, they are usually fought out tooth and nail uh, with surveyors and uh, looking through ancient records and stuff. And, and oftentimes it's over stuff that isn't worth fighting over, but I don't know if it's instinctive, but people seem to fight over where a boundary is more than otherwise. Yeah, I'd recommend don't unless it's super important. Um, real estate disputes, 
such as uh, if somebody owns property or not. Um, that's again rare, but I have seen those cases. Uh, I've been involved in them before. Um, and business disputes, things like a, um, a corporation. Um, uh, if uh, And usually in Vermont, they're small corporations with like three shareholders uh, who own it, uh, who own a store together or something like that. Uh, if there's a dispute between the owners, the shareholders, then that would go to the civil division for, for resolution. Um, last one's criminal division. I just wrote the word don't. And the reason I did that is because the, the only time you go to criminal division as a citizen is usually almost always if you've been accused of a crime. The only other thing would be if you're called in as a witness. Um, I, I've witness. been a lawyer since 1991. I was actually the president of the Vermont uh, Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, and I did a lot of criminal defense. Um, I can't tell you the number of times I heard people say either, well, they said they're gonna drop the charges or can we press charges? Um, <laughs> that you hear that on TV a lot, but it's it's a bad phrase because nobody presses charges. Nobody drops charges. Criminal charges are brought by the state of Vermont. The government of the state of Vermont is the only entity that can bring a criminal charge or dismiss a criminal charge. And, and that even includes if, and it doesn't usually happen, don't get me wrong, but if the victim does not want the charge prosecuted, it's not up to the victim. The victim doesn't have a veto. Uh, to say, you know what, I don't want it prosecuted, so don't do it. Um, if there is other evidence um, of the crime, then the prosecutor is very likely going to go forward anyway, unless, you know, there are other human and humane reasons, which are taken into account. It's not a, it's not a terribly, it can be a terribly vicious system in Vermont, but it, it oftentimes is not. Um, the only th other thing on this is uh, I used to get people saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to the police because I'm going to have him charged with harassment mm -hmm. or for that matter, I'm going to sue somebody for harassment. Um, I'll say it this way. There's almost no such thing. Um, you can bring somebody to court for uh, um, if they're stalking you or they're threatening you for real. Um, or not, not just if you feel threatened and you're, you're kind of weird that you shouldn't feel threatened, but somehow you do, then that, that's not going to work. Uh, but that would be the civil division. Um, likewise, there are things that you can sue somebody for, for uh, intentional infliction of emotional distress. That would be kind of a harassment thing. Um, all, very hard to win those cases, extremely hard. Um, even negligent infliction of emotional distress is an extremely hard case to win. Um, but the, in terms of criminal law, there, there are things like disorderly conduct. Uh, there is a criminal stalking charge but again, that would be the state's attorney. But um, the fact that somebody's being uh, unpleasant and rude and obnoxious and uh, whatever, um, it's, it's not a crime uh, in the United States unless it crosses this pretty significant line. Um, you know, somebody threatening you and yelling at you and, and raising a fist, sure, that, that sounds like it could actually be an attempted simple assault. Um, but somebody standing on a street corner and uh, loudly proclaiming their political view um, or telling you that you did something wrong uh, in a business dealing with them and getting aggressive and angry. I, I don't mean physically aggressive, um, but emotionally aggressive. It's just not a crime. So criminal division, don't. Um, so uh, that that is the uh, conclusion of my, my PowerPoint. Um, so uh, Sandy, I'll, I'll go over to you on this. Do you, uh, uh, do you have uh, questions? Do we open it up? Um, yes, you can uh, open it up. And I do have a question and a, a comment. Thank you, by the way, very much. That was very uh, educational for me. I do have a question about uh, the jurisdiction of local governments. And I also want to say that in the probate court, I believe you, you, um, Maybe we forgot one of the main functions is adoptions. Oh my goodness, that's right. <laughs> um, and, and a lot of there are a lot of adoptions, of course, that do take place in the state of Vermont. So yeah, you know that's the, where you go. Sandy, the terrible thing about that is uh, my my two daughters are adopted. Yeah, I'm the probate yeah. court for that. So um, yes, I uh, I have I have the paperwork still. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Should have covered that. Um, because mainly because it's more and more important, I believe, especially with many new Americans coming into the, the state that yes. 
you know, anyway, so thank you though. Yep. But, uh, okay, I was involved in a case a number of years ago where the city passed an ordinance that said that the police had the authority on Church Street to go on to Church Street. And if they found that there was a nuisance being committed on Church Street by a person, that they could tell that person to get off Church Street and essentially exile that person without a hearing, without any further ado, really. And so essentially they were being exiled, which is a form of punishment in my mind, um, without any kind of a hearing, without any due process. And that was, this, uh, that was an ordinance. So how come the city, okay, so based on that, there were a number of us who went to court, to the Supreme Court and argued that it was unconstitutional um, and the court decided that, well, it could be unconstitutional, but Sandy Baird and Jared Carter did, don't have any authority because they have no standing to standing. sue. Yeah. But yeah. How, how come the city could pass, you said, I think, that the city can't pass ordinances, only the state, which is basically, isn't, it wasn't well, that law? They can, the city can't pass a criminal law, well, you know, make an ordinance into a crime. Um, I, it could be, and again, as I think the Supreme Court would have said, you know, that depending on the effect of it, that could be basically a de facto criminal yeah. law. Mm -hmm. um, but it sounds like they never got to that point. The the counter to that, I don't, and I don't know the answer to your question, but I, I well, can we can put it out right away because of standing. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and that, that sounds bad, um, and it sounds like it was bad in that circumstance. Standing, uh, though, do remember that's that's why uh, Texas wasn't allowed to sue all the other states that voted for Joe Biden. Right, um, right. They didn't have standing to do that right. either. Um, I understood the argument. Yeah. And, and in fact, we did not bring up the argument that that the ordinance itself was passed without real authority. We brought up the argument that it was unconstitutional because it did not afford due process to the people who are going to get booted off. So maybe we just brought up the wrong argument. It could be, but anyway. Maybe. Um, yeah. I um, It's that, yeah, uh, you know, that's the law. That happens in law. So. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing is, is when you're talking about taxes on a local level, that that means in effect, right? That a local, that in the state of Vermont is not a home rule state. Right. Correct that that, True. but do some states have home rule in their municipalities? Yeah, um, they do. I I don't I wouldn't swear to this, but I'm pretty sure that actually New York has a version of that because um, New York City can pass uh, different gun control measures that make it a criminal offense. Really? Uh, and New York City has an income tax, um, but uh. I suppose I suppose Vermont towns and cities could have an income tax if. Uh, uh, if the legislature gave them, and I know they could, if the legislature gave them that authority, then they could do that too. Um, but yeah, there are home rule states. I think it's, I think it's uh, fewer. Um, you know, the, the, the interesting way that I, I view it is um, that, uh, and, and I used to say this in court when I was talking about uh, search and seizure cases where a search warrant did or did not do something, um, that the the federal government is a is supposed to be anyway a government of limited power. Now those limits are pretty far out yeah. there, but it is a government of limited power, mm -hmm. um, meaning that if it's not if the gov if the federal government if it's not said in the constitution, then it can't do that. Then it can't do whatever. Now again that that is interpreted pretty pretty far and wide, mm -hmm. um, but that is the concept. State state governments are uh, the um, the sovereigns meaning like the royalty, literally, um, in, in uh. a system, meaning that a state government can basically do whatever it wants um, because it just has inherent power like a king would, but it's limited by its own laws and its own constitution. Um, so, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying, well, the uh, state, there's no state law saying police can't go uh, seize cups of coffee right. from people. Well, yeah, there is. Um, the police are, that would be theft. <laughs> That's a crime. They're not allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but but the idea is that uh, a state government can do uh, whatever it wants as long as it's not unconstitutional and as long as it doesn't violate um, rights. Um, 
which again can be even things that are not written in the constitution, the substantive due process, their uh -huh. rights to privacy are, are things that are, there is no constitutional amendment like free speech that says you have a right to privacy, but it does exist. Um, yeah. it's, it's a, it's a, um, uh, uh, a substantive due process uh, right. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, towns and cities uh, are, you know, they are completely creatures of the state. Right, um, right. So they, they can only do what they're allowed to do unless it's a home rule state. And then my understanding, and I'm not a lawyer in any of these states, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet my license on it. Uh, but uh, a lot of uh, those home rule states, I think the idea is that the town or city can also kind of act like a state government and do if, it, if it's not if it's not illegal, then it can do it. Um, I guess I have one final question. If it's a if the town um, or a city is the creature of the state, could the state uh, dissolve a town? Yes. Wow. Good. Yes, um, and um, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it's created towns. Um, you know, it, 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 I, I actually found this out, uh, and I'm kind of ashamed. I'm a, I'm a native Vermonter. Of, uh, other than when I lived out of state for four years to go to law school, I've, I've lived here since I was born in 1965. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I didn't know this, but um, I finally found out why Burlington International Airport is actually run by the city of Burlington and basically owned by the city of Burlington, mm. but it's in South Burlington. Um, the answer is that South Burlington was part of the city of Burlington when the airport was created. Oh, really? When yeah. was that? Do you uh, know? Not even sure, but it was, uh, in, it was later. It was after they invented airplanes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that, uh, and actually it was, that was one of the things is South Burlington was allowed to go and create its own municipality, mm. um, its own corporate, uh, municipal corporation of the, I believe it was probably a town at first. Um, but, wow. um, uh, but the deal was that Burlington got to keep its airport. Uh, mm. And by the way, that actually is historically where the South Burlington school mascot was the rebels. Because yeah. They were seceding from Burlington. Ah. Um, so uh, that, that was the, the thing, but I think that was actually even as late as the 1940s. Um, likewise, uh, Winooski used to be part of the town of Colchester. Um, oh. And I, in the, in the early 1990s, when I would do a title search in, in Winooski, um, there were times when you would have to, you have to search a title back 40 plus, yeah. 40 years plus uh, to make sure that somebody has good title. Mm -hmm. And there were um, titles where you could get back to like 35 years in the city of Winooski and then the next reference in, in the deed, in the old dusty book that you pulled off the shelf, um, was a reference to a land record uh, volume and page number in the Colchester land records. Mm. So you'd have to drive over to Colchester and they, uh, they, were, they were used to this. So they would, <laughs> you'd tell them and they'd, yeah, okay, those books are over here and you'd look and sure enough. But um, yeah, so I mean that towns, towns and cities uh, divide off from each other. Uh, so I think the implication would be that if the legislature could could dissolve a city. Um, I, you know, I again, I, I can't okay. imagine that it actually would just on a whim or to, you know, punish uh, punish the residents of a town or something like that. And that in that case, by the way, that's where the gores come in. Remember, Buell's yeah. Gore. What's, what is a gore? A gore is an unincorporated um, uh, municipal area, meaning it does not have a government. And the governor appoints somebody to be the administrator of Buell's Gore, um, of Gore, of the one that I'm thinking of is Buell's Gore, which I think is near Huntington. Um, and uh, that administrator actually acts in many, large part as, a, um, uh, as the town government. Um, in the Cunin administration, before he was on the Supreme Court, uh, Governor Cunin, as a, as a joke, and it was actually funny, it, was, it sounds like it might be insulting, but it wasn't taken that way at the time, um, uh, made um, John Dooley, her administration secretary, the uh, leader of Buell's Gore, whatever the title is for that. And um, he had uh, all kinds of funny quotes that he, you know, rode out to his territory and surveyed his property and all this other stuff. Like he was a medieval feudal guy or something. And again, it it played well at the time. It probably doesn't sound good historically, but um, but Agor Agor is administered by um, the the state government, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. 
Sure. Any other questions here? Any other questions? I guess I, what? I do Anything? have. Oh, okay, there, go ahead. Hey. Anybody else but me or somebody else? Oh, I thought I heard somebody, but. Now, oh, how do I do this? Yeah. Well, you know, it could be worse, Sandy. I had, um, when I was running for uh, re-election for the Wilson Select Board once, um, we were on a Channel 17 debate, and uh, I would have preferred that nobody called in with a question. But what happened is somebody called in and said, yeah, um, if the Williston Select, if the Williston budget were the USS Enterprise on Star Trek, what would Captain Kirk do? Uh, There's no good answer for that. Right. I guess I do have one other question. Okay. So um, I've been very concerned this COVID year because town halls are closed, city halls are closed. We have no access to the city government right now at all. I guess uh, somebody doing a title search might be able to make an appointment, but in effect, public meetings have been halted. Um, and I'm wondering if, and also the legislature was did not meet. The most serious thing to me that happened uh, in the course though, was that town meetings did not happen. Yeah. And that there's now mail-in ballots, which defeats the whole purpose of town meeting. And I'm wondering, is that some kind of a constitutional violation? Will town meetings return to public meetings, face-to-face -face meetings? Or do you have any opinion? Or should I love well, the I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a, a legal answer for you. I do, um, you know, the, I would say that the um, town meeting has been uh, more and more difficult to pull off as towns have grown. Um, mm -hmm. Williston has a town meeting. We, you know, there's about 10,000 citizens in Williston uh, who are residents, um, which is interesting because during the day there are over 20,000 people in Williston. Um, but uh, our town meeting, it, it does exist, but the the things that are actually voted on from the floor are very very limited. The budget is not. Uh, the budget is uh, Australian battle ballot uh, mm. the next day, uh, and it's been that way for a very long time. Um, so I, you know, I, I don't know what, what the future holds. I do think it's either Brattleboro or one of the bees. I think it's Brattleboro, but it might be Bennington. Um, has uh, experimented with representative town meeting, mm. and what that means is that you um, uh, they they section the town off, and certain numbers of people uh, volunteer to you know be voted on, basically elected to be their neighborhood's voice at town meeting mm. um and that you know that that's an interesting combination between representative democracy right. and pure democracy uh, i think that there actually is a, a way where people can just go anyway uh and and just if they want to go they can go mm -hmm. um I, I grew up uh the one of the earliest recollections i have was the very last town meeting in richmond i grew up in richmond um that was actually at the old round church yeah, I, I have a very distinct recollection of that. It must have I must have been three or four or five years old. Um, and, uh, you know, after that, it finally went up to uh, Camelson Middle School. Um, and, you know, after I got out of law school, I was on the board of civil authority. So I would help run the town meeting. And it, it really uh, it town meetings are really good. I mean, I remember a couple, there were a couple issues in, in town meeting in Richmond that I was really worried that the emotion of the issue would carry the day. They, they involved funding of uh, the ambulance. Um, and it didn't. Um, <laughs> the people, people talked about it and they stated their opinions and then there was a vote. And um, you know, in, in my opinion, the thing that was more common sense than that was less mm -hmm. emotional actually carried the day. So um, I, I, you know, voters, Voters at town meeting can generally be trusted. There, there are times when it could be hijacked by a bunch of people who show up who live in the town. But then again, they live in the town. They're voters. Right. What are you going to exactly. do? Exactly. Um, yeah, but I, I don't know what the future holds for that. It's it's uh, something that should be addressed. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I wonder sure. if there are any other questions. Guess not. Yeah. 
Actually, there are um, questions no. in the um, actually there are questions in the chat. Um, so let me let me read them off. Uh, there are two um, regarding allegations of criminal activity by a state official. Does the attorney general defend the state official, or does the attorney general prosecute the state official, or does the attorney general have to co a conflict of interest? Sure. Um, actually, there's there's a statute that the legislature passed uh, directly on point on that. Um, the answer is that the, uh, well, it depends. It, it, a state official could be prosecuted by a state's attorney. It would depend on what the crime is. Yeah. Um, like a, you know, uh, actually we had a um, auditor of accounts uh, about eight years ago who got a DUI and he was prosecuted by the Washington County State's Attorney. Um, other things like that, that would be more in the purview of the Attorney General's office probably not necessarily a conflict of interest. It would depend on the facts, but there's actually a statute that the legislature passed that said that um, if you are if you are a state government employee and you are accused of a crime that involves your state job, then um, you are actually defended by the public defender's office. Wow. Um, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, but it, there could be a conflict of interest uh, if, you know, depend on the facts. Um, but there is, there is a um, statute that uh, addresses most of, most of that scenario. So um, next question, towns can put advisory questions on ballots, even though they cannot become law. What power do these vote, uh, do those votes have? Um, that, that's basically it. The, the towns can put advisory things in, um, uh, on town meeting day. And um, they basically are exactly that. They are advisory to the legislature, um, but they are no, um, no legal authority. So uh, I, I've seen that where the town, um, actually the wording in, in a town meeting in Richmond when I was in college uh, said that the town, the town instructs our members of the legislature to, and whatever it was, and um, there was a huge debate over the word instruct because the town can't really instruct the town, the state representatives to do anything because they are independently elected by the voters. Um, your your uh, power over people in the legislature is at the ballot box and short of that, not much else. Uh, but the, but you know, again, it would be pretty if, if a town meeting voted to, uh, um, you know, advise uh, a, rep, a representative or state senator um, that the town's position on something is X, Y, Z, um, you know, that, that would certainly have sway over the uh, state senator or representative. It may not, may not carry the day um, because again, they are elected on their own, uh, in their own right. Um, but the, the answer about what power, uh, it has no power, no actual power. Um, persuasive, but not powerful. Great. Okay. Yes, well, thank you very much, Ted. I hope to see you soon. Me too. You know, um, I, uh, I, I've been coming into Burlington more and more, so uh, there's a chance of it. Right. Anyway. But don't get booted off Church Street. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, I, um, uh, I I generally don't cause any kind of ruckus, uh, and um, I'm, I'm I'm pretty boring, so I think okay. my chances are good. Uh, we certainly don't think so. So thank you very much. All right. See you. Ha have a good night, everybody. You too. Thank, thank you. you.